Hi everyone, welcome to this week's broadcast of Water, Wind, Wine Ministries. For the last three weeks, I've been speaking to you about Prodigal. If you haven't watched the first three videos in this series, I highly recommend that you watch them. Because this is a really moving series. As I told you in the very first video, I have my husband in the room with me because he's going to draw on the anointing that's on the inside of me. Let's pick up our story in Luke chapter 15, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I've just read Luke chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. And just so you remember where we were, I know that you were here, babe, for the filming of the last three, but just so that they can catch up really quickly. In the last three sessions, we talked about the prodigal son and how the prodigal son has always been presented to us traditionally as a sinner coming to salvation. And that's because of the preceding verses and the situation that Jesus was in when he told the story. And I think that it has a place as a sinner story, but I think it's more impactful in our time now as a story of a person who is in greasy grace. And just so you remember, greasy grace is a person who is operating by the ultra grace of God, meaning that they just sin because they know that they're already forgiven. A couple of points that were in the first couple of lessons. Number one, that the prodigal son is about a greasy grace Christian. Number two, that he wasted his livelihood, not all of his father's money. In other words, he didn't bankrupt his father when he went away to the other land. And the last point that is really, I think, the most important that we've met so far is that the prodigal son came to himself and in that moment he realized that he had no value apart from his father. And so that's where we are going to pick up the story. Now, I told you before that the prodigal son was starving and he had joined himself with a citizen of that country, of the far off country that he went to, and he learned how to make a living using that man's system or what we all call the world system. And so then he realizes that the way that this man was doing it is beneath what he had learned himself. And it says he came to himself. That's in verse 17, that he came to himself. And then he, he said, what I've just read to you, he says, my father's servants have more than enough to eat and more than enough to spare. So I will go to my father and I'll say, make me like one of your hired servants. So what I want to point out is that the prodigal son, like a person who has realized that they are in sin and that they have only value because Jesus Christ paid for them. When they realize how much they have been redeemed from when they realize how much sin that they've actually committed. They have no value beyond their association with God. What they'll typically do is they've gone out in the world and they will adopt a world mentality in terms of getting back with God or getting right with God. Because you see, the world says, if you want to be successful in the world, you have got to earn it. Remember, I pointed out a lot in the last session, I think, that no one gave him anything. And so the world doesn't give, the world takes. So to make it in the world system, you have got to be somebody who can produce. You've got to hustle and work to make yourself worthy of the money that you earn, of the livelihood that you earn, and definitely of the respect that you earn. And so now this son has this mindset because he's been in the world and now he's like, okay, well, I know that the only value I have is with my father and his name. That's the only value I have. But I know that I have done this awful thing. So the only way that he'll accept me back is if I earn it because see, that's what he's been taught by the world. But as we're going to see in just a minute, that's not how God operates, but that's what we do when we understand that we actually have no value beyond what God says that we have or our association with God, we think, okay, well, the way to get value is to earn it. I'll work for it. And so that's what this son is doing. He's like, 
the servants have enough. So I'll be like one of the servants and I'll be the best servant that I can be. And I will earn my father's respect and I'll earn my way back into his house. You see, because the world, if you burn the world once, they reject you. You know, I heard a, a really great statement one time from a woman who had suffered a lot of domestic violence. And she said that she adopted this as her kind of mantra in life. The first time that he hit me, I was a victim. The next time he hit me, I was a volunteer. And what she meant by that was that if you're stupid enough to let that person back in, then you deserve everything you get. And that's kind of the, the mentality that the prodigal son has adopted here. He has this idea that I'm going to show my father that I'm good enough. I'm going to show my father that he can trust me and that I can earn it, that I can live up to his standard of life, at least as good as the servants, if not higher. And I'll get higher and I'll get back into my father's good graces that way. And see, that's a world mentality and that's not God's mentality. I'm going to continue. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So I just want to take that little excerpt out right there. The, the son has it in his heart that he's going to humble himself when he finds his father and he's going to say, I'll work for it. Don't worry about it. I'll earn it. Okay. You can trust me because I'll earn it because he's used to the world system saying, if you've, if you've cheated me once, you'll do it again. And I think that a lot of Christians are that way. Hyper grace Christians, legalistic Christians, baby Christians, old Christians, Christians, period, people, period. I think a lot of just people are that way. They say, if you've burned me once, I'm going to forgive you, but it's wise not to give you another chance to hurt me. And that's not what God is displaying here. So what happens is the son says, okay, I'm going to go. And he gets up and he goes to where his father is in a far off country member because he had gone to a far country. So he's had time to process this, to work out his speech, you know, to get it all right. And he, and he goes and he sees his father and his father sees him. And before the son can open his mouth, the father runs to him and hugs his neck. Now I, I just want to pause right here for a second. Because when Jesus told this story, he told it from a bird's eye view. In other words, he knew the whole story, beginning, end, everything. And he was telling us the whole story. So we have an insider's view of it. But what we're going to find out later is that the older brother, he said to his father, your son has wasted your livelihood with loose living. Now, my question is, how did the son know? that the other son wasted the money. I don't know. But the point is that if that son knew, then it's really likely that the father also knew. Wouldn't you agree that that's reasonable to think? Okay. So knowing how much the younger son had wasted, the father was not moved by unforgiveness or regret. He was just happy to have his son back and he, didn't give him the opportunity to even apologize before he forgave him. And so I think of course that this story is perfect when we talk about a sinner, but what we do with sinners is we say, Oh, you have to repent. You have to you catalog all of your sins and get them under the blood and you have to go to God. And if you don't do that, then what if one's, you know, out there, you didn't get it under the blood or whatever, you know, and, and that's a bunch of, that's a bunch of bull, according to the prodigal son story. Um, and then what we'll do is once you're saved, then every time you sin, you have to ask forgiveness for it. Or we'll do this. If somebody offends us, they have to come to us and ask for forgiveness from us. We'll forgive them, but we don't tell them that we've forgiven them until they come and actually formally apologize and talk to us about it because we think that it's somehow wrong, somehow allowing them to continue to hurt us if they don't come and at least acknowledge they're wrong. And that's not what we see in the story of the prodigal son. We see the son coming, the father coming, and the father rushing him 
without the prodigal son even getting a chance to say he's sorry. So in terms of a greasy grace Christian, I myself have been in this situation where I didn't do a particular thing wrong my whole life. I didn't do it wrong. And then when I became an adult, I did it wrong. And I felt so terrible. And finally I came to myself and I, I realized that I had no value beyond my relationship with God. And so when I ran back to his arms, I said, I'll do anything. I'll do anything if you take me back, you know, and, and that's just because I was tainted by the world. You know, that, that understanding that I know you don't trust me right now, but let me earn your trust back. But that's not how God operates. God says, the minute you set your heart to me, I'm running toward you. The minute you said, oh gosh, I'm not worth anything without him. The minute that crosses your mind, God is on the lookout for you, just waiting for you to, to come within leg shot of him. And the good thing about God is that there's nowhere that you can't be within leg shot of him. You know, it's not like you have to go back to a, to a distant country for God to run up and hug you on the neck. I mean, at any moment, he's right there. And so, so after the father hugs his neck and the son is, he, he, he has to get his speech out, you know, father, he says in verse 20, oh, excuse me, father, uh, verse 21 and said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. One thing I want to point out about this is that the son said, I have sinned against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. It's very interesting that he says, I've sinned against heaven. Don't you think that's interesting? Instead of him saying, I've sinned against you, he says, I've sinned against heaven. Why does he say that? And why is it recorded in the Gospel of Luke? Why did Jesus say that? Because up until this point, this has been a story that's very earthy. You know, Jesus is telling it as a parable and we have it in, in, as a parable and we know that parables represent the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And we understand that. But here he explicitly says, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. So here's what I want to point out is that when you sin against God. When you go out and you're already saved, you're already in the family and all of the provisions have been made for your life and you dishonor that by wasting what God has given you by prodigal living. Number one, of course, God sees you, but all of heaven that was being held for you, sees you. In other words, the, the heavenlies who are rejoicing when you do well are suddenly saddened because you have fallen in this way. And so sinning against heaven really means that you are taking some of your reward away when you get to heaven. Okay. But what we're going to find out, it's, it's not so significant that it will really affect you. So, so the father and the son are in this embrace and the father doesn't even acknowledge the son. Watch this verse 22. But the father said to his servants, he didn't say anything to the son who had just gone through his little speech. He didn't say, Oh, I love you. I've missed you. I'm so glad you're back. Don't worry about what you did. He didn't say anything to the son, nothing, zero. He says to the servants, he says, you go and you bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. I want to point out what he's clothing him with. He says, bring out the best robe. That's really important because this robe is the best, implying that it's the only one. In other words, it's not a good robe or a nice robe or a robe. It's the best robe. Okay. And the reason I want to point that out is because this is really indicative of the robe of righteousness that we are clothed with. It's not a different robe. You as a Christian don't have a different robe of righteousness than I do. And the reason that it's not a different robe is because it's Jesus's robe. That's the best robe. I know it doesn't really make sense. How can we all have the same best robe? But we do. We all have the same best robe. And he says, bring out the best robe. Now I, 
did a little study on the robe and the ring and the shoes, but the robe speaks of rank and it, it speaks of dignity. In other words, he completely restored him to his former rank. So the son is thinking, I have to earn at least a servant's rank and then my father will trust me and maybe I can earn rank of his son again. And without even hearing his apology, or acknowledging, I should say, without even acknowledging his apology, the father gives the son the rank back, just like that. And then it says that he was to put a ring on his finger. Now, it's a ring. So it's not the ring, it's a ring. And a ring speaks of authority. It speaks of you have the authority to walk in my stead. In other words, whatever you say, because you're wearing my ring, goes. That's exactly what this ring signifies, that he has the authority to operate in the name of his father, just like I have the authority to operate under your last name. And it's exactly the same concept. And so he's immediately restored his authority back. He's immediately restored his rank back. And then he says, put the sandals on his feet. Now what this speaks of is dominion and protection. So immediately the father gives him back rank. He gives him back authority to operate in his name, run the company business, trust you with all the money all over again. And he's protecting him by putting the sandals on his feet and giving him dominion over all the ground he treads and anything that might be slithering on the ground that he treads. You know, Jesus said, I give you all authority over scorpions and serpents and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And that's exactly what these sandals are. These are the authority sandals to walk and have dominion over everything. Nothing can it, it hurt you at all. Nothing can penetrate these sandals. And this is a big deal because what we do as a person who has known God and been in a relationship with God and then sort of fallen away from God and got into this hyper grace thing, we think, oh, I've got to earn it when I go back to him. And you go back to him with this worldly mindset saying, I'll have to earn it, I'll have to work at it, which didn't come from God. Because if you had to do it in the first place, you wouldn't have been a greasy grace Christian, you would have been a legalistic Christian, and you probably wouldn't have gotten off into the stuff you were in. So that tells you right there that the world has infiltrated your mind. And so you go back to God and you say, okay, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to promise I'll never do that again, you know. And I know from my personal life, I have messed up pretty good and I was spoken to by God and he said I want you to trust me to keep you from doing that in other words he didn't say I want you to show me that you're not going to do that ever again he said I want you to trust me to lead you away from ever doing that again and that's what this son is experiencing at this moment the the son is experiencing this father saying I don't care what you've done with the money I gave you. I don't care what you did with all the gifts I've given you. You are completely restored and I completely trust you 100% with everything I have all over again. And that's a big, big deal. That's a huge deal. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up for this session. Remember that I love you and that Jesus loves you.